Fantastic. Again, morning everyone, and it's wonderful to be able to come together in December and worship like that to sing carols. There's something about those Christmas carols that just uh, stir you and fire you up, and so thank you so much, worship band. Uh, it's such a joy to be part of this church, uh, and I say that honestly. Um, it's, it's so exciting to see what God has done, the momentum, the people, the family, uh, what God's called us to. And so it's a joy to be able to preach and to preach the final or penultimate chapter of Romans this morning. Uh, and it's been an amazing journey. If you're just joining us today, uh, we've been on an incredible journey in the book of Romans. Uh, we started in base camp, went down into the valley of sin and realized that we're all fallen. We understood the gospel, the crux of salvation, that we actually come to a place of peace with God by his gospel, by grace, uh, and there's freedom in that. There's now no condemnation for those who believe. And we got up to the top, the summit of hope, and we saw the incredible view, what it is to understand the gospel, to see what God has done for us and what Christ has done for us, and the view of his purposes in the world. And then we've begun our descent uh, down the hill, down the mountain, clouds of mystery, understanding, trying to see exactly how does it all work? What does it look like for the church? the descent of devotion, a new calling to be the people of God and to be God's people in the world, uh, and then return to community, uh, that we are a community of believers. And now the onward mission, what does it look like going forward? And it's fantastic that we're at the end of the year because we're beginning to look to 2024 as a church and say, what does that look like? The onward mission, uh, and that's exactly where we are today. And so it's exciting. I'm going to start with a question this morning. Should the church be a family or an army? I asked the life group leaders this the other day when we did a life group leaders training. Surely the church should be a family. We all love one another. Peace, my sister. Peace, my brother. Looking so lovely today. With my Sunday smile, we all love you. Thank you for coming along. We're a family. Or should it be an army? Guys, there's a war out there. There's a devil and he hates you and he wants to take you down. And if you're sleeping, you're going to get taken out. Shape up and fight and get ready for battle. Should the church be a cruise liner? We're all enjoying on the top deck, cruising along, catching a tan, sun cream. Or should it be a battleship? Should we be preparing for war? What do you think? Hands up, family. Okay, well, you five can come to lunch at my house. Hands up, army. Hands up, both. Great, let's pray. Jokes. The answer is, throughout Scripture, you see God's people, the church, is both a family, but also an army. And it's so important to grasp that as river of life, that we're essentially a community for one another, supporting one another, encouraging one another, but we also have a mission. We also have a war to fight. We are commissioned. So the church is a family and an army. And that's exactly what Paul is nailing in chapter 15. When he gets to chapter 15, he's continuing a bit from what he said in chapter 14, but he wants to drive this home. And it's almost like, Paul, we've heard this. When I got to the beginning of the ser my sermon this week and I asked the church, they all put up their hands. They know this stuff. But then you've got to ask your question, why isn't it being outworked? Why is the name of the church so disrespected in the city and in the country? Why are people laughing at the church and saying it's a business? Saying you guys are just in it for the money. My boys at school, when they hear dad's a pastor, they say, why aren't you rich? Good question. Perhaps Paul is driving at something here. He's giving the second last chapter of the book to Romans to these foundational principles in the church that he wants this Roman church to grasp. Some of the final writings of Paul, he didn't live much longer than this chapter. 
He's in prison. He gets out of prison. He travels a bit. He gets rearrested when he gets to Rome and he goes back to prison for the rest of his life. So we've got to take this seriously. This isn't just wrapping up the book of Romans. He's fighting for something here that he wants the church to imbibe, to be a part of. Let's read it in chapter 15, 1 to, we're going to look at 1 to 6 first. A serving community. We who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Each of us should please our neighbors for their good, to build them up. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward, toward each other that Christ Jesus had, so that with one mind and one voice, you may glorify God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he moves from chapter 14 into 15 with the same message and the same theme. And he continues to emphasize this huge principle of the church that essentially is of primary significance for us if we're going to be the body of Christ. And it's this one anothering. It's this community of, the, of believers. It's that we are committed to one another primarily as family first. The reason he does that is firstly, we need it. You need the church. We've fallen into a world, we've got into a horrible place in the world today and largely because of COVID. I think the COVID was one of the devil's greatest attacks on the church. Because people now, now think they don't need the community of the church. I'm all right by myself. I'm self-sufficient. Everything about the world today is telling you to become self-sufficient and, and stand on your own feet and not be dependent on anybody, particularly the church. You can stay at home and watch on TV. You can sort yourself out. You can watch any pastor in, in the world. He's online. Watch his YouTube channel. You can get a sermon in 30 seconds. It's called TikTok. But Paul is saying, guys, there's something greater at play here. We need one another. That's why he begins to say, you who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak, not to please ourselves. Isn't that totally contradictory to the world? Totally upside down. If you, you read it in the gospel according to the world, you who are strong, please yourself. Don't worry about the weak. Don't worry about the poor. Make it your own. Build your own kingdom. Each of you should please your neighbor for, your, for their good to build them up. The world says build your own big house, your own kingdom. Put dura walls up and electric fences so you don't actually see your neighbor. You see how Paul is writing completely contrary to the nature, our, our fallen nature. For even Christ did not please himself. But as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. And Paul exhorts us to be a community and a family that looks out for one another. Looks, you who are strong, help the weak. You who build up one another for their good. Do not be selfish. And then he upholds the example for us to follow. If you ever need any motivation for this kind of we're a community, we're a family, we're here for one another, we live for one another, we lay down our lives for one another. Paul, in three verses, says our example is Christ. He says, take a long look at your Savior if you need to be convinced that we're here for one another. We're here for the community. Verse 3, for even Christ did not seek to please himself. Verse 5, may God give you the same attitude of Christ toward each other. Verse 7, which I don't think we read, accept one another just as Christ has accepted you. And Paul goes after the importance of church community. 
as the primary characteristic of the church. The motivation is church community. And more than that, I think you all know that. I think you could say, Andrew, we know these verses. We know the one another verses. We've done it in life groups for the whole term. Love one another, care for one another, forgive one another, uphold one another. I think there's 52 one another verses. One for every week of the year. But when he says, Christ is your example, do it as Christ would have done to you, that's a whole different level. This is not just social work now. This is something completely different, which is why verse 5 he says, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. And you may think it's just a passing phrase that Paul is using there. But to the Romans and the Jews, this would have sent a lightning bolt. Because he's quoting David from Psalm 69. David says in Psalm 69, when he's facing his hardest, toughest, greatest attack from his enemies, as David seeks to rebuild the temple and seeks to represent God in his community, he's begun to put himself out there and say, guys, the church, the temple, the people of God is what I'm living for. Psalm 69, verse 9, it says, For the zeal of your house consumes me, and the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. King David, in his toughest time, in his hardest time, when he's been attacked for standing for the church and for God's people, he says these two things, zeal for your house has consumed me, and the insults of those who insult you fall on me. It's gone to another level. David is saying, I'm willing to stand for the church and for God's people. And if I get attacked and insulted and even killed, that's okay. And that's something way more than love your neighbor as yourself. Be, you know, be kind to one another, join a life group, you know, join the worship band, sing, sing in the choir, do all these sort of things that we think the church is. And it is. We can often tend to tick the box to say, this is what I do. I do this for the church and this for the church and this for the church and I'm good. Yet David is able to say, zeal for your house consumes me. I looked in the mirror this morning knowing what I was going to preach. <laughs> it's hard when you preach to yourself. And I said, have I ever said that? Have I ever said of myself, zeal for the house of God consumes me? We get consumed by so many other things. Zeal is, is a, and it's a wonderful word. It's, it just means you're all out, you're all passionate, you're willing to lay down your life. They called them zealots in the Bible. The guys who are all out for God. And what shows zeal for the house of God is when you're willing to take insult, you're willing to take flack, you're willing to take persecution, and you're willing to say, I'm going to go on anyway. What is so incredible about these verses, I'm sure you've seen it, Jesus walked into Jerusalem as this new prophet, this one that everyone wanted to hear about, this one that everyone was talking about. There's the man of God in town. He's coming to Jerusalem. He had healed the sick. He had raised the dead. He had a huge following. He walked into Jerusalem and he turned to the church. People thought he was going to go to Caesar and overthrow him. He turned to the church. His back on the world and on politics and on self-gain and building his own kingdom and becoming a leader of the world and he went into the, into the temple and he cleared the temple. He overturned the tables and he made a whip and he got out all the money changes and corruption and filth in the church. What did the disciples say? It's in Luke. They looked at him and said, zeal for his house consumes him. Quoted David. And then full story round, Paul writing to the church in Romans 500, uh, 70 years later, Paul says, insults fall on you when you stand for the church. Have you been attacked being a believer recently? Have people said that River of Life church, eesh, the music is so loud, it's way too noisy. Or well, they got crazy people there, co colors and services going too long, or no parking. You stand and say, that's my church. 
Don't talk like that. We've got to get to the place where the seal, the zeal of our Father's house consumes us and we're willing to take insult. Jesus did it. He's our example. As he hung on the cross, zeal for his Father's house and his people consumed him. It's wonderful seeing, seeing the church growing and seeing the momentum and seeing all that God has done in River of Life this year. It's actually mind blowing, it's staggering. But it's not for nothing. That's what Paul goes on to talk about. He's made us a community. He's made us a people. He's added people to us. He's given us resources. He's given us incredible gifting. But it's not this that we can be a family and that we can be a holy huddle. That's what Paul moves to in the next part. Let's look at verse 7 to 13. Carries on, accept one another, then just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the Jews on behalf of God's truth, so that the promises made to the patriarchs might be confirmed. Then in the, in the scriptures, it quotes the four promises from the Old Testament. Uh, and then he ends, verse 13, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with the hope of the power of the Holy Spirit. Paul moves gear from saying, guys, you're a community, you're a family, support one another, lay down your lives for one another. Look at how Christ laid down his life for you. You do the same. You're the church, you're a family, accept one another just as Christ accepted you. Then this incredible verse, verse 8, I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the Jews on behalf of God's truth so that the promises made to the patriarchs might be confirmed. And again, this is amazing. It says Christ has given himself to the Jews, which is true. He came essentially. He was a Jew. He, he came to the Jews that the promise of the patriarchs might be confirmed. And this just sounds like Old Testament crazy language. Many of us overlook it. What was the promise to the patriarchs? You can read it there. They're in the other verses. They won't come on the screen. We've got your Bible, verse 9. It says, I will praise you among the Gentiles. Rejoice, you Gentiles, with the people. Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will spring up on one and will arise and rule over the nations in the hope. Uh, and in him, the Gentiles will hope. So this incredible principle that Christ comes to the Jews in order to bless the Gentiles. Christ comes to give himself to the Jewish people and to be the Messiah of the Jews in order that the Gentiles would praise the name of the Lord, would be uh, built up and, and those promises. And you get this principle for the church that we become a community, we become a family in order to bless people, not in this building, outside. The church is the only organization in the world that exists for its non-members those who haven't yet joined, those who haven't signed up. And so as much as we're a family and a community and we're caring and loving one another and laying down our lives for one another, the reason we do it is for those who have not yet come in, for those who are not yet saved. Jesus came to the, Gentile, so Jesus came to the Jews that the Gentiles would be saved and blessed. And that's the whole book of Romans that, that Paul is trying to get across to the Jews. Guys, grace is for everybody. There's now no law. Anyone who puts their faith in Christ can be saved, even the Gentiles. And God calls us to be a cross-cultural community on a mission. Again, why? Much like I said, why do you need the church community? Because the world needs to see a different. The world can't offer genuine cross-cultural community. It's not possible. I challenge you, where in the world do you get different cultures and colors and tribes and tongues coming together to serve and love one another? Unless it's the church or you win the Rugby World Cup. But the World Cup only lasts a few months. Those people who hugged and kissed and loved one another in the stadium will still start throwing stones at each other a few years later when Sia Colisi has moved on and playing in Toulouse. But the church, the only organization where genuine cross-cultural community can exist. 
Look at this building. Where else would you see people of different tribes and colors and nations willing to worship together, to praise, to sing? And yes, we have beef with each other. You may look across the church and say, oh, that guy, I remember he cut me off in traffic this week. Now he's in church. Or worse. Messed me up in business. But it's only when we have the gospel that we are able to truly say, I forgive you. It's only when people are different to us that we're able to say, in Christ, he's my example. He came to the Jews for the Gentiles. I know you can't sing those long Indebele Zulu words. Thanks, Karen, for helping us with faith. What's your attitude when that song comes up? Do you say, oh yeah, this is this is the, the, the indigenous song that we have to add? Just to be cross-cultural? And I'm just gonna sit through it. Or do you say, wow, this is what is gonna happen in heaven? This is going to be every tribe and tongue singing with every language around the throne of God. This is the church. This is the only place where God can use his people of all different tribes and cultures and languages to worship him. I don't think we're going to be singing in English in heaven. (laughs) But it's only in the church that we get this. And it's because people have not yet been saved. So we're a community, we're a family, but we're also a mission. We're an army because Jesus came that the Gentiles would be saved. And this gives us great hope, great life. You see, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. When we grasp that we're a community and we love one another and serve one another and lay down our lives for this body called the church, And we realize that we exist for the benefit of people not in our building. We exist for the nations. We exist for the people. There's hope. There's a purpose. There's something to live for beyond yourselves. That's what Paul is after. This twofold existence of God's people. We're a community on a mission. They call it the church. Paul, finally, verses 14 to 17 calls them to this. He speaks life into them. He begins to speak very personally to the church in Rome. Remember the church in Rome was Jews and Gentiles together trying to make it happen. They hated one another outside the building. In the building, they found Christ and the gospel and the forgiveness of sins. That's who Paul's talking to. And he speaks exactly the same to us. Verse 14 to 17, he says, I myself am convinced, brothers and sisters, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with knowledge and competent to instruct instruct one another. I've written to you quite boldly on some points to remind you again because of the grace that God gave me. Be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles. Gave me the priestly duty of proclaiming the gospel of God so that the Gentiles might become an offering acceptable to God. This is a Jewish guy writing. It's like saying... I'm I'm preaching the gospel that Hamas would find Jesus. This is the, the level of what he's speaking as a Jew. He says, He gave me the priestly duty of proclaiming the gospel of God so the Gentiles might become an offering acceptable to God, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, I glory in Christ Jesus, my service, in my service to God. He begins to call them to mission. He begins to say, guys, you're a community, you're an army, and we've got work to do. And you know, those those poor people in Rome, they've just given their lives to Christ, their whole world has been changed. They're feeling, there's no goodness in me. I'm a terrible sinner. You won't believe what I've done. They're feeling, I don't have any knowledge. I'm not really competent to teach people. How many of you feel that? And Scott jumps up and down here and says, guys, we need you in the kids' work. We need you in the kids' work. And you say, I don't think I can teach kids. Or I don't know if I can sing. Or I don't know if I can lead a life group. Paul speaks to this precious church and he says, guys, I'm convinced 
you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with knowledge and competent to extract one another. I've written quite boldly on some points. He's been harsh in this, in this book. He's challenged them. He said to Jewish people, you need to accept the Gentiles and love them and build them up. I think some Jews would have walked out of that church when they read this letter. They would have said, Paul, we love Jesus. It's great, but I don't like these guys. I can't live with these guys. You want me to accept and love and build them up? He said, I've spoken quite harshly because of the grace God has given me to minister Christ Jesus to the Gentiles. What Paul is actually doing, he's exhorting them, he's encouraging them, he's saying, guys, you can do it. I believe in you. He begins to talk about what he's doing. And it's an order. You read between the lines, he's saying, guys, come with me. Come on this mission. You guys can do it. Don't just be people who sit in the church, come along, say, go, Paul, we believe in you. Go, Paul, go, Paul, you know? He's saying, guys, I need help. We're an army. We go together. We do this together. The gospel has got to be proclaimed across the world to people and races and tribes that we may not like, we may not know. But Christ has called him. That's what he says, to be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. I glory in Christ Jesus. He's saying, follow me as I follow Christ. I believe he speaks to the Romans, but also to rollers. He speaks to our church. He said, guys, there's, there's work to be done. There's people that need to be saved. There's whole communities that have not heard the gospel. In our country, we're going to be that church. We're going to be those people. I am convinced that River of Life has the ability, full of goodness. We have the knowledge ability to instruct one another. We can do it. Paul is saying, let's go. Let's do this. Let's be that church that Christ died for. Cross-cultural loving community who's willing to lay down its life for the mission of God. It doesn't mean we all have to go full-time. Please. You guys meet and reach and touch people that I will never see. I have to come to church every day. There's not too many guys swearing and smoking and cussing. I promise, it's quite a peaceful place during the week. You guys, you're out there in the world, serving, loving, caring, whatever God has called you to be. Paul is only saying, I'm using my gift and my personal calling to reach the Gentiles for Christ. I'm saying to you, use your gift, your personal calling to reach the world for Christ. And that question, when you go home today and look in the mirror, and you see you've got less hair than you used to. You've got an optician's appointment at nine o'clock tomorrow morning. You know what's coming, hey? I've had them for two years. And I've been refusing to wear them. But I'm like, what do people think when A.E. has to put on glasses to read his Bible? So for a year and a half, I've been printing my notes on 14. That's why there's three pages. And I've been holding my Bible like this. And I know tomorrow morning he's going to say, A.E., you need to wear these all the time. And I realize I'm getting old. I've maybe got 10 years left, 15 years left. There's no time to waste when the world needs to be saved. Paul was able to say this, if you could say this at the end of your life. So from Jerusalem all the way around to Illyricum, I have fully proclaimed the gospel. That's going to go on his tombstone, I'm sure. The known world. This guy who used to kill Christians. Before you're saved, Paul used to arrest and kill Christians. The end of his life, he's saying, I have preached the gospel from Jerusalem, where I lived, all the way around to Illyricum, which is the furthest place he could get to, through Turkey to modern-day Greece. It was 10,000 miles. 
planted 10 churches, wrote to each of those churches. He didn't know he was writing the New Testament. Shipwrecked, beaten to within, in his life, imprisoned, and he died in prison. And he's able to write, I have preached the gospel to the end of the earth. And he's saying to us, follow me as I follow Christ. What's going to be written on your tombstone? What do you want them to write? I've always said to my kids, I just want A-E. Because it should be enough. Should, your name should be enough. It's what people think of you when they say your name. It should be enough. This is why Paul is writing so passionately to them. I encourage you when you go home, look in the mirror and say, zeal for my father's house consumes me. And see what the Holy Spirit does in your heart. If he says yes, you're saying the truth. All good. If when you look in the mirror and say, zeal for my father's house consumes me, you think, Ish, I don't know. And I look at my New Year's resolutions, my priorities, where I put my money, where I put my time, my effort. Does it show that zeal for my father's house consumes me? So we stand and I'll pray. Oh Jesus, this morning we gather and thank you for what it's been to worship you to sing these incredible worship songs, such truth of in a dark, cold tomb. One breath changed eternity. We thank you for what it is to take communion, to remember that your body was broken for us, your blood was shed, not just for us, but for the sinners and the, the world that is dying. And we thank you for these scriptures that Paul wrote to a small Roman church, maybe less than 50 people, who had given their lives to Christ in an oppressive dictatorship where the church was laughed at and mocked. Lord, I thank you that you call us as rollers to have a zeal for your house. Be willing to take insult and flack, persecution. Thank you, Jesus, that you're our example. What it is to stand for something far greater than your own life. To give your time and talents and treasures for an eternal reward. Thank you for Paul. Thank you for this man who wrote the book of Romans in prison, chained to a God in case he tried to escape. Father, deliver us from being selfish, self-centered, building our own kingdom and trampling on the weak. May this description in the book of Romans speak about us and our church. May this army and mission who gives itself that the Gentiles might be saved. We thank you for all you've done in River of Life. We thank you for the amazing growth and momentum and gifting and talent and Thank you that we can have huge joy in our church and yet for the mission you've called us to. Thank you for the opportunities and the open doors that churches and families of churches are calling and saying, please come and teach us. Please come and show us. Please come and Lord, we ask that you would equip us and strengthen us. Thank you that we are convinced that we're able to instruct and teach, encourage and build people across our city. Thank you for planting us in different places, different workplaces, different careers, different office blocks, because the Gentiles need to be saved. Would you shape us and mold us in our priorities going into the new year, that we would be able to say, zeal for my father's house consumes me. The insults that fall on you fall on me. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.